Well, I told I tell these people I come up here to remind them of their southern heritage, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> try to teach them to talk right, you know. <laughs> Use good words like, you know, aorta, like aorta pay us more, and uh, <laughs> and, and mayonnaise. Man, there's a bunch of boogers up here. <laughs> and would you, did you? Hey, did you bring your flashlight? Would you, did you? <laughs> did you eat yet? No. Did you eat yet? No. Done it. <laughs> Done it. Eat yet. <laughs> the the right. one that, that gets a lot of them is fixing. Fixing, that's right. Yeah, Hell, I don't know. It's, it's a measurement people up time. Now. And you can always tell a southerner by, we know where yonder's at. Nobody else know where the hell yonder is. <laughs> hell yeah, I know exactly where, oh, over yonder. <laughs> yeah. Yonder there. So yonder that damn hill. <laughs> That's right. Where is it at? Down the road. Yeah. No, it's over yonder. <laughs> we also know what directly is. <laughs> yep. When are you going to get that yard cleaned up? I'll get it directly. You know. <laughs> <laughs> We're the only ones have a clue when directly is. That's right. Bigfoot Crossroads Radio. I'm your host, Matt Kay, joined with my other host, Jonathan Brown, and uh, got a special show. A couple of very good, close, personal brother friends of mine. You know them as Bear and Kumbo, or if you don't know them, you're in for a treat, we'll say. How y'all doing? Great. I reckon we here. We found yonder anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Might have to explain reckon now. Oh, well, hell. We know what yonder is. It's what <laughs> happens when you drink too much and then you, you haven't, go drive the car. You haven't covered reckon yet. Uh-oh. Well, I reckon this is going to be a hell of a show. I reckon our ass is in trouble up to our eyeballs. You reckon, Tim? I reckon I'm sore. <laughs> <laughs> Hope it's not too sore. <laughs> Wrecked them, hell, they killed both of them. <laughs> now, uh, you know, Jonathan, I've known for a little while now, not very long compared to you guys. Um, mm -hmm. But Jonathan and Bear both, uh, before the show, had both inquired what the plan was, uh, you know, how we were going to carry out the show. And having the experience with you two, I know that's impossible to do. <laughs> so basically, he's talking about you, Tim, and ain't me. I know he is. <laughs> well, I was just trying to get a rough idea as to what it is that we we're going to be doing, and uh, I was like, "So, do you want to? What do you want to talk about first? Who do you want to talk to first? He's like, "We can't. We just have to let it fly." Now okay. that's up to you. You you are the ones pointing us in the direction. The problem with us when we get to starting about something, we never actually finish it because we branch off into so many damn different directions that every one of them has very important uh, meaning towards what we're discussing in the first place, which is boogers. And, uh, we call them boogers in the South. That's what we've always known them as. Uh, I was always told there was boogers. You, you got to understand, this is way before we even knew 
uh, Roger uh, Patterson and uh, Gimline when they took footage of a, what we call a booger. He called him a Bigfoot and a Sasquatch in 1967. We didn't know what the hell a damn Sasquatch or a booger was. Even to the extent we thought that this was something different other than what we had. Am I correct, Tim? That's right, yeah. Yeah, we always, around where I grew up, there were boogers or haints or no heads. Yep. Now, and when, when did you guys meet up? Uh, what, about 99? It was 99. 99, yep. Yeah, we had uh, we had corresponded a few, a few times uh, over the phone, and oh, I didn't, you know, I didn't know, uh, uh, you know, really what to think of Bear. First time I talked to a few times, I talked to him over the phone. Really does, do they? I, I still don't know what the hell to think of Bear. <laughs> but you know, he he said enough of the right things to to uh, to make me think that he. He knew more about he knew more about boogers than about anybody else I'd talked to very much about them. Now, uh, now before you all met up, uh, you had obviously had experiences with these things growing up, um, right? But you guys had basically been doing it on your own, hadn't you? Right. Yep. Yeah. I know. Uh, I had been. I had been actively. You know, I'd been poking around on my back of my farm and stuff like that, and in the, in the area in the neighborhood of our farm uh learning about them and and you know studying on them and of course i first first time i ever heard about them i was three years old you know my grandfather you know, told me some stuff about them and and I, you know of course at that age it doesn't sink in on you and you know you don't know if it's for real or not yeah, right just but, pulling your leg to get you on inside right. the house whenever it gets dark right <laughs> but then Later on, as time went by, you know, I heard things and stuff like that, and I knew that, well, there was something going on. I really knew that there was something going on when we heard a bunch of squalling and screaming and hollering down uh, down the lane, uh, you know, below our houses. It, when I was growing up, there were five families that lived on our farm. There was, you know, my grandparents and us, and then there was a family that lived uh, two families that lived close to my grandparents, which they were across a 40-acre field from us, and uh, and over there there were you know three houses, and uh, one of them was a was the guy that sort of ran the farm, and the other one was uh, the fellows that ran our sawmill, a family by the name of Hudson, and then uh, then there was another family that lived over on the west part of our farm, but uh, we were all over there at my around my grandparents' house and. And that's where the tractor shed and the barns and everything were. And something got to screaming off down the bottom to the north of us. And, and uh, you know, I remember, you know, a bunch of us kids, you know, what's that? What's that? That's the first time I ever heard them up close. And, and you know, and the Hudsons were asking, you know, what is that? What is that? And they, uh, you know, my grandfather said, oh, that's just those old catamounts, you know. Don't, don't worry about them. And... My dad said, you know, I remember my dad saying, "Oh, don't tell them that, you know, you know, don't don't talk about that." And he said, "Well, hell, that's what it is, you know." And <laughs> and anyway, it wasn't very long after that, uh, you know, that that, and I don't remember if my mom came over and got me and took me back over, you know, back home, or if my dad told me to, you know, hit the road and go back home. I don't remember, but. Um, uh, you know, I was back home. I was home. You know, which a quarter miles to the to the south, and and you could still hear them down there. Well, later that night, um, I mean, and the the Hudsons had like seven dogs, and these these are rough old rough as a cob old coon hounds. You know, hunting dogs, plot hounds, and and catahoulas and stuff like that. And those dogs are not scared of anything, and uh, and they were barking and raising hell and. Oh, about the time it got real good and dark, uh, you know, along about 10 o'clock or so, we could hear the thing. Of course, this was back in the days before we had air conditions because everybody had their windows open and all, and and we could hear the dadgum thing getting closer. And all of a sudden, and we could hear the dogs barking, and all of a sudden there's this god-awful damn, you know, fight broke out. And then, I don't know if the booger attacked the dogs or the dog dogs attacked the booger. 
But at any rate, the booger in the in the dog pack ended up tying up, and all of a sudden we hear dogs squalling and hollering and yelling and being killed and whooped and hurt and and all, and the uh, the booger went through that pack of dogs like they were nothing, and I think he killed all but maybe like two of them, and the Hudsons packed up in the middle of the night and hauled ass. They were gone by in the morning, and never never came back. <laughs> How old were you roughly when this took place? Oh, I was less than five years old. Um, it uh, I was less than five years old. And what year was this, Tim? Because you're a little oh, older than me. This is around uh, this is around 1958-1959 time frame, somewhere around in there, and. Um, you know, and I and you know, and then we moved into town when I was uh, in the uh, in the fourth grade, and uh, you know that would have been about 1964, 65 time frame somewhere around in there, and um, uh, and I didn't really hear much about them till uh, about 1968. Somewhere around in there, um, uh, the uh, neighbor neighbor to the west of us that also went to school in town like I did, um, uh, they were watching TV one night. Watching it was back when Monday Night Football had first come on, and they were sitting up watching Monday Night Football, and the uh, they heard they had two German Shepherd. Watchdogs or guard dogs. Well, expl- explain this town you're describing, Tim. Town is not houses on top of each other. Try to explain no. yourself. A well, bit. now out at the farm, out at uh, this, out around our farm, it's not. It's not a town. It's just rural countryside. I mean, you know, it's, there's houses scattered around. You know, they're they're not houses on top of each other. But you know, you can see your neighbors' houses and stuff, and you know. Um, uh, you know, but there were long, wide areas there where you know you could go a mile or so and wouldn't there wouldn't be any house, you know. But but uh, this particular place where these folks lived west of us was over on a hollow that was uh, on the Tennessee River. You know, they had la- they had lakefront property, so there were houses all around that lakefront. They were in a subdivision, um, but it wasn't a big subdivision. It was just a road that went around the waterfront, and there were houses on the water side of the road but not, nothing but woods for a mile or so over to our farm uh to the east of them and um anyway um they were watching tv their monday night football the dogs start barking and raising holy hell and they got up and flipped on the floodlights you know that around they had floodlights floodlights all around their house and they flipped them on they looked and there's a bear out there in their garbage can at the end of their garage. And they uh, open the door, turn the dogs out on the bear. The dogs go hauling butt out there, and all of a sudden the bear stands up, but it wasn't no bear. And the do- the thing, it was a booger, and the thing grabbed the first dog and um, broke its neck and throwed it up on the I think it threw it up on the roof of their house, if I remember the story correctly. And then it grabbed the second dog and broke its back and threw it. And I think it bounced off of their their back deck or something like that or their back porch or something and then landed off in their side yard. And they shut the lights off, slammed the doors, locked them, grabbed their rifles, and, and I think they, they got in their closet or something or sat in the house with the lights off. I don't remember the story. But he came to school the next day telling his story about – this Yetis, this Yeti that killed their dogs. And at that time, we had never heard of a Bigfoot. We'd never heard of a Sasquatch. Sasquatch. And uh, But National Geographic had had a show on TV talking about the abominable snowman or the Yeti. And it showed some pictures of it. And that's what, that's what this guy, he described it as a Yeti. And, oh, my God, they teased him mercilessly about that. And... Uh, uh, and that was in the in the late '60s, and you know so I would often uh, childhood 
memories and experiences with these things were basically aggressive acts towards dogs at least yeah and they would uh uh i don't know i used to have um oh i had a i had an incident happen when i was just a little kid just before we moved off the farm where my my uh I, we had bunk beds, and we had those old casement windows that cranked out. Yeah. And, of course, they were up pretty high off the ground because, you know, they the hot air rose, and you want to get as much air out of the house as they could. So we always – I had my – always slept with my with the bunk beds pushed right up next to that window, and I'd sleep on that top bunk and with the with the window open to try to get some air through there. And we had a had an attic fan in the house, so it'd suck air from outside in through that window across my bed. And – I don't know. I heard, yep. Yeah, and I heard something one night outside sniffling around and stuff around. And I really don't even remember the noise it was making. Seems like it was sort of a grunting, snuffling noise. I thought, well, what the hell is that? You know. Well, I didn't think that. Ain't, I didn't think that at that age. Of course not. I, I, mean, you're, <laughs> but I thought, you're you know, a what in the world is that? Young man, you wouldn't think that. <laughs> exactly, but uh. But I, you know, without thinking, I leaned out of my head out the window, and there was this booger standing there with his back up against the wall, flatten, trying to flatten himself out against the wall, and uh, and he was, he was to the. I, I looked to the. I looked out in the yard, didn't see anything. I looked to the right, didn't see anything. I looked to the left, and there he was, about, you know, he wasn't, you know, five feet away. And there I had my head out the dad gum window, and I was looking eyeball to eyeball with him. And how often how tall off the ground? Because I know that I've been to well, this house that Tim's talking yeah. about, and it's built yeah. up off the ground, guys. And yeah, this it, is also an elevated window to boot. Yeah, this thing, uh, this with this, the bottom of this window was probably six and a half feet off the ground. At that uh, on that side of the house, and uh, so this thing was probably I don't know seven to seven and a half feet tall. So it wasn't the alpha or anything like that, but it but it was it had its back up against one. And it looked at me and it sort of bared its teeth at me, but it wasn't really like it wasn't really like it was growling at me. It was sort of like a like you see monkeys do sometimes where they'll sort of bare their teeth, you know, and almost like a an orangutan trying to smile or something. Mm-hmm. He had gas. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I jerked my head in and I cranked that window shut. <laughs> and and I remember I had I had nightmares for years about a about a, a monster, you know, being outside my window looking in. And I scooted my bed so that uh you know, when I, I turned my, I remember I scooted my bed 90 degrees around in my room after that so that my, my I wasn't right up against the window when the window was open. So, uh, <laughs> Let's make a fellow think about what might decide to stick their hand in there and just start feeling around, don't it? Exactly. Well, exactly. Now, Bear, some of your first experiences involved them creeping around your window as a kid, too, didn't it? Yeah. Uh, what happened is, and, um, uh, I don't want to tear into a lot of it, but you can devalue anything that I tell from this story because every lick of it has a uh, valuable meaning to why it actually happened. Uh, But in 1966, I was six years old. My brother was, uh, he had to have been four. And the reason I remember the year is because my baby sister was not even six weeks old yet. The reason I remember all that is because of the fact that my mother and my father separated that night. And uh, as a child, six years old, I didn't know what was going on. I just knew that daddy wasn't there anymore. You got to understand this acre is the only acre on my grandfather's property that I still do not currently own because my mother couldn't retained the house she had to sell it uh she was a single mother working in 1966 uh i know it was summertime probably early spring uh no i'm wrong about that let me back up i know when my sister she was born in july 
She was six weeks, so it had to be in August. All right. Uh, we would keep a box fan in the dining room pointed outward because just like uh, Kumbo, we didn't have air conditioning back in those days. And what we'd do at night, we would turn that box fan on in the dining room and raise all of our bedroom windows so the air would draw through the house. It was like a suction, you know, it would draw all the air through the house and have an even flow mm -hmm. circulation. Well, <clears throat> I don't know what time it was at night. I, I do know that my, after the fact, my baby sister was probably teething because she was fussy and she was crying and, you know, there was nothing mama could do about it. Plus, I already knew my mother at the time was very upset over the argument that she got into with my father the night he left. Uh, he left all of us kids there. Me and my brother slept in the uh, bedroom on the back side of the house. Well, when my father built this house, we had to bulldoze off all the ground to make it level enough to lay the foundation. And when we did, we pushed all the extra dirt to the back side of the house out of view of the uh, gravel road out front. And it kind of caused uh, the land to go from a level to a, like a uh, <clears throat> about a six or seven foot rise that put the top of that ground where they pushed the dirt up to level with our bedroom window. Well, of course, like I said, it was the only acre of land that my grandfather gave to my mother to uh, build a house upon. And he had cattle and we had horses and everything on the property. And so my grandfather fenced this in with a, I can't remember if it was a four or five strand barbed wire fence. What I'm saying is it had five leads of barbed wire or four. It was, I'm, I know we had at least four on it. But in certain locations over there on the property, we would have five strands. But getting back to the story, uh, due to my mother uh, probably being very emotional, my sister was cutting up and crying in a high-pitched voice. Sometime during the night, our window <clears throat> excuse me, was facing to the east. That's where the barbed wire fence was. The bed was... Uh, abutted against the back wall to the west. In other words, at the foot of our bed, we could see outside of our bedroom window. It was squared up. Of course, the window was up, and I remember the curtains gently blowing inward because of the suction of air coming inward. Something woke me up. I don't know if it was early or late or whatever. As a six-year-old child, you don't think of things like that. But uh, something woke me up. And, of course, the house, every light in the house was off. And uh, when you're asleep like that and you wake up, especially out in the country, there was enough ambient moonshine or moonlight outside. It, the moon may have actually been in a more full stage or whatever, but it was pretty bright out back. And I heard something going, whoop, <coughs> I said, what in the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> so I raise up. I remember this as plain as day because uh, this was one of those moments that, you know, when you're really scared or something mon monumentous happens in your life that just takes your breath away, you remember those moments. And I sort of raised up, and I realized that this sound was coming out the bedroom window. Well, between my window and this tall embankment, which was level with uh, our window, was all of probably 15 yards. I don't deal in feet. I deal in yards. I played football. I can judge yards better than I can feet. So I, 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 I judge distance by yardage instead of footage. I never figured out that three feet equals a yard, and I don't do the math worth a damn. Couldn't go the rocket scientist. I'm not. <laughs> Anywho, I look out this window, 
and propped, now understand what I'm saying, propped over this four-strand, five-strand barbed wire fence with its arms on our side of the fence, its body on the back side of the fence, more to the east, facing directly towards our window, was what at the time it struck me as the biggest damn monkey I've ever seen in my life. This thing was leaning over the barbed wire. Now, you got to understand, barbed wire is, you know, these barbs on them, they're sharp as hell. Right. But the way this thing was draped over this fence, it, I knew that those barbs were cutting into its underarms. But it wasn't bothering it a damn lick. This thing was stooped over this four-strand barbed wire fence, which, if I had to guesstimate, is about four and a half, maybe five foot tall. This thing was stooped over the fence, leaning on the barbed wire, gently swaying its upper shoulders and its head in a uh, right and left motion, cooing and clicking at my ass. Looking directly in the window. Looking directly in the window. Now, remember what I said earlier about my baby sister crying and my mother emotionally? I mean, a lot of this has meaning, especially now after all these years, and I know what I know. But anyhow, this thing was doing it, and it blew my damn mind. And so I reached over there to my brother, and I woke him up because he was one of the most sound sleepers there ever was. I woke him up, and I said, look, look, look out the window, look out the window. And he just took one glance. Now, you got to understand something about my brother. When he sees something that he don't understand and he don't like, he is gone. The first thing he did when he recognized what he was looking at, he hauled ass out of that bed heading straight (laughs) to my mama's bedroom. Well, people, I'm going to tell you, fear is infectious. (laughs) When... I was left behind. I was making damn sure I was straight on his ass. <laughs> I, we both hit my mother's bedroom. We dove into Mama's bed. Mama was slowly crying at the time, but she heard us raising hell coming to her bedroom. We dove up in the bed with her. Mama, 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 there's a, there's a monkey outside the window. There's a monkey outside the window. And I always remember this. Mama said, y'all just had a bad dream. But I also remember that Mama never got up to go look out the damn window either. (laughs) And uh, I remember that was probably the last night that me and my brother ever slept with my mom as far back as I could ever remember. And uh, later on in life, uh, about in the 1970s, I can't exactly remember when. We're going right back to what I said earlier. As a small child, you don't remember when, but you remember circumstances that dictate certain things. I do know that my sister was not in school at the time. The schools we went to, we was going to first grade when we were six years old. This was back in the 60s and the 70s. Now you have to go through nursery school and kindergarten then you could make it to the first grade school we was going to it didn't work out that way you went to school in the first grade at the right young age of six so i know my sister wasn't in school i remember that much so she had to have been around five we was out catching what we call in the south well, well let me back up a little bit my mother lost the property due to the fact she was a single mom couldn't make the house payments. And we moved in with the greatest man I ever knew my whole life who taught me everything I know about hunting and fishing and tracking. And eventually it was boogers. And this is what led up to him coming clean with me and my brother. Of course, my sister was too young to realize it. It was probably, I'm thinking, around 1970 or 1971, We'd been on the farm all this time. Uh, We would be bused into school from my grandfather's property, and we'd always come home every evening. Uh, We was out in the back pasture late one evening catching lightning bugs. Yankees call them fireflies. 
We called them lightning bugs because their ass lit up like a light. <laughs> we had mason jars, and we was running across our back pasture, which that's where my grandfather's cattle and horses would uh, feed every day and so forth and so on. And there was plenty of cow manure and everything out there, which I'm sure nobody gives a damn about. But it has a meaning toward this story, too, because wherever you got fresh manure at, lightning bugs seem to gather. Now, if you know anything about lightning bugs, you know that they breed, and when they breed, that's why they their tails light up. They're trying to attract a mate. And the only time they do this in the South, they do it all summer long. But when they really get to be very numerous doing this is in the early spring. So I'm guessing this happened in the spring of 70 or 71. And we was out in the back. Tasting these lightning bugs, we each one had a mason jar. We'd catch as many as we can, seeing who would have the most lightning bugs in the and mason jar. You, you put the lid on this sucker and it'll light up. You take it to your bed with you at night, and you know you had your night light, even though they'd all be dead the next morning. But at that point in time, we didn't care. Uh, my grandfather had done stuck his head out the back two or three times, and. Actually, I think he even tried to use that old uh, warning that uh, most kids in the South, especially back in those days, grew up with. Y'all better get your butt in the house or a booger's going to get you. Well, we've been threatened with this booger for years, especially after we moved into our grandfather's. We never associated the booger with the dang monkey that was looking in our back bedroom window in 1966. We just thought that was a monkey. A booger or something else. We just don't know what it is yet. While we was chasing around these lightning bugs, my grandfather come out there about the third time. Each time he'd come to the back door, it was getting darker outside. So it was right at show enough dust dark. It was the sun had already gone down. Uh, it was real dusky. Uh, the light wasn't pure by no means, but you could still physically see. Well, while we was out there playing around. And my grandfather come to the back porch to yell at us the last, the third time. He noticed something on the fence line towards his left behind where we was at. And he was about, uh, I'd say about 60 yards, 70 yards away from us. But the only way to get to that pasture, you had to go through a fence on a circular route around a shed. And uh, in other words, you couldn't just go and jump over the fence and be where we was at. You had to actually go out of your pathway to get to the fence to go through to where we was at. And when he saw this thing, he saw it next to the tree line. And it was in a stooped over posture. And it was rocking gently back and forth. There's that gentle back and forth motion again. Uh, I've learned since that that's a nervous reaction that these things have when, you know, they're not committed or they're worried about, you know, something going on in their close vicinity. It, it, they, they either pace or they pants or whatever you want to call it from one foot to another. It's just a nervous reaction. But we didn't know boogers or anything at the time. And this thing started loping towards us on all four limbs. It was actually leading with its left arm in a knuckle-walking type position. Us kids did not know this. We was too wrapped up in chasing, catching lightning bugs, going back and forth, trying to outdo the other. And when this thing started loping toward us, it was actually about 70 yards away from us. But uh, my grandfather, he he didn't have a gun near him or nothing. He 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 just he bailed out the back porch, started screaming and raising ten times worth of hell. Well, me, my brother, and my sister, we was not spoiled by any means because my grandfather was a very gentle, quiet type man. He was always very patient with us. And for him to start screaming and raising ten times worth of hell was very uh, unnerving to us because we'd never heard him react this way before. 
so it, it was kind of like a cartoon scene in my mind, replaying it after all these years. I could see me, my brother, and my sister automatically turning and looking towards our crazy-ass grandfather just going nuts, you know. We noticed when he was running towards that fence or to that gate that he wasn't looking directly at us. He was looking back over our right shoulder. And there's that cartoon scene again. I can see me, my brother, and my sister turning at once to look and see and what my grandfather's raising hell at. When we saw it, that thing was loping towards us. It wasn't in a hurry. It was loping on all four limbs. Uh, my brother, as I told in the first story, he saw the song of a gun, dropped his damn mason jar to hell with the lightning bugs, and liked to knock my granddaddy down and get into the house. I mean, at least he was consistent about it. I'll get you that one anyway. My sister, though, her legs just melted out from under her, and she started screaming in a high-pitched voice. Here I was wanting to go chase that brother of mine like I did the night in 1966. But I seen my sister laying there on the ground just screaming. And I was looking at my sister and I was looking at this thing and I was looking at my grandfather. I mean, I was back and forth, back and forth. I was torn between indecision. Should I leave my sister? No, I can't leave my sister. I got to be here for my sister. What in the hell can I do? This thing's going to get us so far so on. I mean, I was... I was just ready, literally just scared to death. Uh, I knew, and my grandfather knew, we talked about it later on in the life several times. We we read, lived this a bunch of times. Uh, knew that this thing, I, I had enough sense to know being the oldest that this thing was going to get there way the hell before my granddaddy was. And I said, oh, Lord, what the hell am I going to do? So I started looking on the ground for a stick or anything. Of course, like I said, I'm in the middle of a pasture. There's no sticks. There's no nothing. And I wasn't going to pick up a cow pad. It's a chunk at him. I didn't figure it would do much good. So uh, this thing was still open toward us, even though my grandfather was raising kid times worth of hell. And even though my brother had already just physically had just left us in smoke, but my sister was still laying on that ground screaming and raising cane and, and which, you know, undeniably that that's, you know, should be and would be her reaction anyhow. And I was just scared between whether I wanted to run or whether I wanted to stay with her, but I just stayed there firmly planted, you know, nothing brave or nothing about it because I was scared to death. Bear, and, didn't, Bear uh, didn't know. Bear didn't know where to scratch his watch or wind his ass. <laughs> you damn right. <laughs> <laughs> and I've run into those situations since, Tim, and I can promise you, I still can't figure that one out. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, this thing, when my grandfather he was running, I mean, we're talking about a man that was probably in his sixties at the time. Well, uh, yeah. He may have been about 56, 58, something like that. About my age right now. And uh, I've never seen this man run in my life. And he was getting it. I knew that this thing was going to get there before we was. It just so happened when my grandfather went through the gate after he avoided being run over by my brother, he came within sight line of this booger that was heading directly toward us. Well, when my grandfather come within the booger's vision, this thing locked its brakes. You can actually see, up until that point in time, the expression on its face. I, I thought about it a million times in my mind's eye, and I don't think it was actually meaning us any harm. I think it had really got caught up in the moment and was actually coming out there to play with us. And the ones I've seen over the years since then are a hell of a lot bigger. So I'm guesstimating that this one was one of those who, uh, I call it an immature one. He wasn't a teenage one. He wasn't one that uh, was old enough to mate with a female. I, I think he was just one of the ones that uh, 
was between uh, the point where he had been weaned from his mother, been given a part in the troop, and uh, he had just got wrapped up in what we was doing to the extent he wanted to come out there and play with us. Of course, while we was running after those lightning bugs anyway, we was squealing and laughing and cutting up high pitch for us the whole nine yards like kids always do. Uh, I think that drew his attention, and they drew him to the extent that he wanted to come join us and catch them lightning bugs. Only he didn't have a mason jar. He didn't bring that to the party. <laughs> but uh, when he saw my grandfather, though, you could see the expression on its face just change. It was like it was embarrassed. It come to a complete halt. It come within 10, 10 maybe 12 yards of me and my sister. I could see it real clo up close at this point in time. It had hair on its body, but it was sparse. In other words, it wasn't thick. It wasn't coated. It wasn't. Actually, this thing looked like he had the mange. In the knee area, in the uh, wrist area, in the elbow area, along his shoulders, it you could see the skin pigmentation under the hair. And the skin pigmentation was more like a native, uh, uh, what we call an Indian, but I, I'd prefer to call them natives, uh, skin pigmentation. It wasn't black, even though I've seen black ones over the years, skin pigmentation that is. And uh, <clears throat> it stood up, and it looked like it was just scared to death and embarrassed that it was caught in this situation. And it was like it realized, I don't belong here. What did I just do? I just screwed up. Uh, and, and this thing slowly turned to its left and bipedally on its two legs in as uh, straight a position as it could assume, which they all have kind of a stooped over position. They, they can't lock their knees. In other words, they don't walk like us. They, their legs never will lock, not the ones I've seen anyway. And it just started slowly walking back to the woods behind us to its left, all the time looking between my grandfather and me and my sister who was still screaming on the ground. It slowly walked into the wood line and then it disappeared. Now, what what did your uh, grandfather uh, say once he got a hold of y'all? Well, the first thing he did, he picked my sister up, and of course she, he was consoling her. And uh, I I don't remember crying, but I do know I was scared to death. And I also remember that when it walked into the wood line, I couldn't take my eyes off of it, but. You know, my grandfather was there at that point in time. So I was safe in my mind. Right. Was there any uh, uh, further conversation? Did you, you know, Grandpa, there was, was there, that? <laughs> there, was, there was that night. That was when my grandfather tried to attempt to come clean on him already knowing these things were there. He told us that was a booger. Because of course we all we asked him. Uh, I remember more so me and my brother asking than my sister. Actually, my sister has tried to just blank this memory out of her whole mind. I mean, she had a lot of problems with sleeping, and uh, she'd have nightmares. And <clears throat> actually, she took up sleeping with Mama in her bed. And then when, like, when Mama had to work night shift at the factory in the local town. She had sleep with my grandmother, but she, you know, she she always slept with somebody with an adult. I would guesstimate up until uh, my mother remarried and we moved to a big city in the Mississippi Delta. And uh, my grandfather though was explaining to us, he he knew what these things was, but he also knew that we wasn't old enough to really know that much about them yet. But he. He said that he would promise the older we got, the more he would share with us, and uh, which he did. And uh, <clears throat> he just gently tried to ease it to us. He he did emphasize, though, don't never tell nobody what you saw because not only will they not believe you, they'll think you're crazy. Uh, yes, you've seen something that uh, uh, not many people have actually seen, 
but they are there. Now, uh, Here, what did the what did the face of it look like? Huh? What face, face on this like? one? Uh it it was like human, but it wasn't. Uh, it, it even it, it looked like it had what you call what's those uh Joe Dirt type haircuts? Uh, what do they call them? Mullet. A mullet. mullet. A mullet look. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, when it turned its back to go recede in the wood line, and this makes sense too. The way that the hair come down off of its back and its head into an uh, alone across the slope of its shoulders, it kind of went down into a V line to its yep. uh, rear end crack. And it, and you know, thinking upon it and knowing the things I know now through all these years, it would look when it's running alone on all fours like it has a mane. Do y'all get what I'm saying? Yeah. In its face, it, it it really did. It look it didn't look emancipated like I've seen some older older ones later not on ama- in life. Emaciated. <laughs> yeah, not emancipated. They were never slaves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> emaciated. <laughs> well, you well, know they might have been 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 We know, we know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's one of them deals. <laughs> that would be a bearism. I can spell it, but I can't say it. You know, it, uh, you could tell it was a young one. I bet it stood almost six foot tall if it was that tall. It was a male. There's no doubt about that because it was swinging in the breeze. Uh, this thing, it was hard to tell what it was when it was loping, but we also knew it wasn't a cow, it wasn't a horse, and it didn't belong there. It's and, a, uh, somewhere... It was somewhere between like, like an animal, Joe Dirt, and an Indian, like somewhere. Well, in the yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, also, the appearance took on the biggest, you know. And I'd heard of them, and never actually seen one. Uh, the appearance of a timber wolf, but it didn't have a long snout. Yeah, that's not. It didn't have no snout. <laughs> We're not talking about dogmen here. No, we're not talking about dogmen, but when it was on all fours coming toward us, I believe even at a distance it could be described that way. Right. You know, especially with the long flowing mane behind it, the whole nine yards. Actually, it could probably even be uh, misconstrued as a bear, but it was the weirdest looking bear I've ever seen, but it wasn't a bear. This thing stood up on two legs and walked into the woods and, uh, I, like I said, I was watching its eyes. I've heard so many times over the years, never look one directly in the eyes. Well, that's comparing them to gorillas. These things, a gorilla don't have a chance against a booger. I already know this. Uh, a gorilla uses brute strength and his instincts, whereas this thing can think. And I believe after the first round or two, a gorilla would be tied up in knots. But... uh it was very broad across its shoulders. It would have made a football coach very proud, even at its right young age. Uh, it uh, it did have canines. It wasn't grimacing or grinning at us, but you could see it. I mean, you know, it was standing there. It had more pronounced lips. The nose was not as squatty across the face, but it was there. Uh, it was more like a flattened type with wide nostrils. It, it didn't have a sagittal crest, I guess that's what they call it. Uh, it was more rounded type shaped head. Uh, getting back to what I originally was saying, though, I never took my eyes off of its eyes. That's, you know, they, they say that the eyes are the window to the soul. And watching its eyes and watching its demeanor when it changed from, in my opinion, uh, playful, wanting to join in on the fun, because it never looked like it was meant to harm us or hurt us. But, see, that could be my opinion. I mean, its very intentions could have been it probably wanted all three of us. I don't know. This. Well, I'm it, just guessing. Like, it's also interesting um, in the terms of just overall animal behavior, how whenever it initially approached you, it approached you on all fours. Right. And then whenever it saw your grandfather, 
it stood was up red. and made itself look as big as possible. Yes, and and see that's what gets my um, blows my mind about it, especially knowing what I know to this day about them, is it was so focused on me, my brother and my sister that even my brother running didn't click on the prey predator trait that we know these things do and will acquire when they're chasing something. They get caught up into the act, and it, it, I think you know that this one. It it was so focused on us, it didn't even pay any attention to my grandfather, which is what initially caught me and my brother and my sister's attention. Because my grandfather was acting, I mean, screaming, yelling, doing everything he could to try to distract it from us. And I think that's what's totally amazing, too. It was so centered on what it wanted to do at that given point in time, it ignored him until he come into its sight picture. <laughs> 